and four other students um, over the course of a semester in our interactive game design course. Um, so let's go ahead and get into the game. It's a rather short experience, but don't worry, there's plenty to talk about over the course of the next hour. So let's get into it. So Call of Darkness is a narrative-driven horror adventure game set in 1920s Chicago. Um, you play as a detective investigating the disappearance of a local mob boss. And that's about all that you're supposed to know up front. The game design, um, what we were really going for was sort of a, um, a puzzle game. We were going for a horror-themed puzzle game. And effectively, the idea is that each level in the game serves as its own puzzle box. So as opposed to having puzzles throughout the game that you're meant to solve, each level is sort of its own puzzle to be unwrapped and unraveled. So let's go ahead and get into the game. Um, we start out at this warehouse that's supposedly the last place where the infamous mob boss was seen. We get some nice little tutorial text here. Open the inventory, and we get our controls listed in the diary. Luckily, I know the controls because this is actually the level that I designed, um, which makes things fun. It's shockingly hard to pretend that you don't know the solution to puzzles. <laughs> Let's go ahead and walk in, take a look around, see what's going on in the warehouse. So this game, like I said earlier, is developed by five people. And yesterday I was watching Indiecade and there was a group that presented a, a similar horror game where they said that they had the problem of having five programmers and no artists, we had the opposite problem. <laughs> we had a bunch of artists and no programmers. Um, and had quite the fun learning experience making this. So it seems that door is locked. But we can definitely see that there's stuff in there that we need to get to later. I'm sure we'll find a way in. Because if we can't find a way in, then that means I designed this level bad. Let's go ahead and check what's in here, though. Nice little break room for all the warehouse employees that are probably doing something illegal. After all, it's prohibition area. It's very popular to break the law at that time. Got a clue. I feel like playing Scooby-Doo. Forgive me if I uh, spend half the demo throwing chairs around because it's a lot of fun to play with physics objects. You know, I don't think that we've been in the room that's depicted on this paper yet, so we might as well go ahead and find that. Um, on the team for this game, when we were thinking about what kind of game we wanted to make for this course that we took, we all sort of had a love for horror, but also a love for tabletop RPGs. And we were heavily inspired by Call of Cthulhu. And uh, our, our whole design document was just a laundry list of touchstones. Um, so we really wanted to kind of focus in on the exploration angle of a bizarre environment where you can really play around with, you know, weird things and just kind of breaking logic. So in this drawer, we definitely seem to have something. It seems to be a picture of the main warehouse floor. We're just in. I believe all the other drawers are empty, except for that one, which it's locked. And no skeletons in the closet. 
but we could have put one there. It would have been fun. <clears throat> I'm a little bit congested, my apologies. Hmm. Here, we can climb up here and get a better vantage point. No, you cannot jump on top of the roof of that. I have tried many times. I can't get it to work. But that definitely seems to be the same set of crates. That one definitely seems to be circled. So let's go check that out. <clears throat> Aha, there's a familiar sight to just about anyone that's used Unreal Engine in the past. It's a great little, great little prop. <laughs> it's definitely eye-catching to people who haven't used Unreal Engine in the past either. A lot of people ask me what on earth this thing was supposed to be when we were doing playtesting. I have no clue, but I think it looks cool, so we used it. So if we look here, this first piece of paper that we picked up earlier, we can definitely see that that is meant to be in the office on top of the shelf, so let's go ahead and put that there. And hey, that's the room we found earlier. What do you know? <laughs> Take a look at this note. Trapped in the cellar. Wait for Sandy before he open the door. He'll know what to do. Consider this my resignation. Nah, I'm not coming back. A little note from Marvin. Marvin, your handwriting looks suspiciously like mine. It's almost like I might have made that texture. Press V to equip the light or don't mind if I do. Yeah, that doesn't help us see much. But there is a light switch on the wall. Let's go ahead and flip that. Now we can see. <laughs> yeah, one of our goals in this game, this game's horror themed, but for us, horror really is a thematic element more so than an excuse to scare people. So we tried to get the biggest scares out of the smallest gestures we could think of. So instead of, normally you'd think that being in the dark, that's the scary part, but turning on the light and seeing that you've been walking over quite a mess this whole time, that's fun. That's fun. It's one of those things that we genuinely love playing with. See someone in the chat mentioned the lighting. Thank you very much. This lighting rig is absurdly complex and the fact that the game is running at a stable frame rate at all is <laughs> a bit of a miracle it took a lot of time and a whole lot of effort on uh on my end let's go ahead and close up the doors just because it's bothering me that they're open and you, when we were in that last room, picked up a drawer key, and I know where that goes. Because there was that locked drawer earlier. Yeah, because, the, uh, because of actually how this lighting rig is set up and how complicated it is, it's a great way to test new technology. Um, so I'm not sure if I said before, this game is made in Unreal Engine 4. And um, within three hours of Unreal Engine 5 releasing, um, we 100 
about color blindness. Anyone can hop into a game that's black and white, but originally the inspiration for making it black and white, we wanted to full on simulate eight millimeter film and like nail like the grain and the aspect ratio. It was terrible. It was unplayable. People already complain about excessive motion blur and grain, and we took all those complaints and cranked them up to 11 and expect it to be fun. It wasn't. <laughs> so uh, there, there's a pro tip for you. Don't, don't do that. But the monochrome look ended up being great. Let's go ahead and use the manager's closet key. Pop that sucker open. Oh, I was lost for a moment. Oh no! Did we lose the stream for a moment? Okay, that's fine. So we're back. Hmm. Anywho. So at this point, we're gonna need that lighter. Because it's quite dark down here. And at this point, we stop playing the part that I've designed. So this, uh, this isn't an uncommon sight for Prohibition America, it's a speakeasy. Most popular way to break the law. <laughs> well, socially acceptable at least. So we can definitely go around and check this place out. Seem to have another note on the table. Uh, left the key on the booze shelf. Marvin. Again, Marvin seems to really have terrible handwriting that looks a lot like mine. There's definitely a shelf of booze, though. Probably not something I want written down on paper. That's some uh, solid evidence that Marvin knew all about the operation. So we might as well look for that key in the most enjoyably. Yeah, it's physics objects just never never get boring. Check up on the shelf. Hey, there it is. That's small and easy to miss. I wonder if a bunch of playtesters missed that the first time we uh, tested it. <laughs> There's a... Oh, man. We had a lot of... Um, we had a lot of problems when we were playtesting this game because... I, I'm sorry if this game's really dark. Because it is really dark. Um, and we had a lot of problems with people when we were originally making this, looking around and just kind of not seeing things. Um, probably our most infamous example was we, at one point, we had a gun that's no longer in the game, and we had tutorial text on the ground telling the player to pick up the gun. Or it didn't say pick it up, it said like press 1 to equip the gun, and we had a guy walk up to it and loudly say, why would you tell me how to equip a gun if I don't have one? And then he turned around and walked away. So, that was, that was great. Let's keep exploring the speakeasy a bit. Now, this is an uncommon site for a speakeasy, they don't tend to have, they don't tend to have full libraries on them. Of the exact same book. <laughs> I'm sure there's something weird about one of these. There's a lot of identical books, and I don't feel like shuffling through all of them, so maybe we'll find out later. Actually, we did pick up that key. So I'm assuming that key is going to open something, and I'm willing to bet... It's going to open that door. Don't let him out. Well, signs are meant to be ignored. It's, uh, it's not horror if the protagonist is a little bit less than smart. 
And since I'm your protagonist, I will be unsmart for you. Let's go ahead and unlock that. Finally, an area that's lit, so we can turn off the lighter. And uh, this seems to be the cellar that poor old Marvin was talking about. <laughs> but, uh, hey, it seems to be empty. Wow. I'm not, I'm not sure what to say here. Um, it's a cellar. I wonder what we're supposed to not let out. Here we got a picture of that library and a written text two five up three over eight. Let's go ahead and take that with us. And also maybe turn on a lighter because uh, something might have entered the room. And hey, something did enter the room. Yeah, so that's the only jump scare in this entire uh, in this entire short game is that little dude at the end of the hallway, <laughs> which is fun because you can one hundred percent play through this and not see him, depending on the order that you solve the clues depending on the order that you find everything. Um, and that led to another great playtesting thing where the first round of playtesting, I had six people play this game all at the same time in a Discord server. One of them, only one, saw the man with the broken neck. Just one. And everyone else thought he was insane and just seeing crap. But, um, I mean, I thought it was really funny. Sorry, Kevin. It, it was really funny that you're the only person that found that. <laughs> two, five, up, three. Okay. Let's try two. So probably... Probably the second bookshelf. Two, five. Two, five. One, two, three, four, five. Up, three. Up three over eight. One, two, three. Eight. Yep. That's definitely a book. That That's definitely a... Uh, that's a Scooby-Doo. <laughs> Come on, gang. Let's split up and look for clues. Because that definitely opened something. And it probably doesn't lead to Scooby Snacks. I will say it's quite hard to find anything when you are trapped in the dark with a lighter. I think one thing I didn't get to highlight earlier is that we did, um, one of the people on our team minored in music theory, I can't remember which, and he actually fully scored this game. And we ended up not using, like, most of the music that he made. It was really unfortunate because we just couldn't get the cues and the timing um, down right. So, in the end, there's just one track of his that plays, and it's um, much earlier when you initially enter into the second area with the speakeasy. Go back to the top of the stairs to pick up the second lighter. <laughs> we got time, I can do that. This is, again, I apologize um, what we actually have prepared here. This is a very short game and we're actually very shockingly close to the end. It's only been 20 minutes. Um, yeah, but we 100% had a second lighter placed on the ground up here. <laughs> so, yeah, um, famously in the original Doom, you can play through the entire game 
starting every single level with just the pistol because it's easier for the developers to test doom like that by just starting each level with the pistol and placing all the items around um yeah no we did that exact same thing in fact this entire level used to be like fully lit they had tons and tons of lighting you could see around but uh the level designer that worked on this wasn't happy with the lighting um so he just removed them all and he said hey you put a lighter in your level right i'm like yeah he's like beautiful that's all the lighting i need It is indeed uh, short but sweet. We are quite happy working on this. So let's go ahead and inch forward. This is clearly what must have opened up when we uh, when we move the book. Take a couple steps down and click the ladder to climb. Don't mind if I do. Go ahead and walk down that. Um, the designer of this level is a massive fan of Metal Gear Solid. Uh, very massive. If you, uh, if, yeah, it's a ladder you get. It. Um, <laughs> and this tunnel should lead us forward. <laughs> well, this this is where I get to break it to you that um, this totally is the end of what we actually have repaired. We wanted to have a third level. We had this entire sewer area that we wanted to have finished by the time we got into Indicade, but it's just not here, which is unfortunate, but we're very happy um, <laughs> with what we do have to be continued. <laughs> Um, good hearted Jake. We also had a completely different layout. Yes, that is one of the other people who worked on the team uh, with us. Um, yeah, we... I mean, we playtested most of this game. I think I mentioned earlier that we are all artists. This is our first time working with Unreal Engine uh, blueprints with doing any code work whatsoever. Um, and we initially prototyped the entire game on the tabletop in call of cthulhu <laughs> um because that's what we knew that was the inspiration for the game um i can let's see i can totally restart the game um, from the beginning explore it and show off more of what we did um but as a whole, that's the entire experience, and I, I think that the thing that's more interesting, I mean, we're 100% still working on this game, we love it, and we want it to be more. Um, the, mo the best part, cutting content to meet a deadline, never heard of it. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of fun cutting content, like so much of it. Um, it's it's not even the same game. <laughs> it's not even the same game we originally planned because um that that's life. That is 100% life. Oh, well, thank you for saying that the assets were well rendered. I greatly appreciate that. Um we spent like half our rendering budget on the uh buildings around the level like if i deleted all these buildings the uh <laughs> the frame rate would double and also yes chris we used a paper prototype i know that's your favorite thing on the face of the planet <laughs> yeah originally for this game we end up stripping it down into a uh into a puzzler because you know, I, I think that's worth talking about how we ended up with this short puzzle experience that we have. Um, because we went through so many different phases. We had, like, an attribute system and, like, skill trees 
and we're gonna have weapons and like it's gonna be kind of an action game and when it came down to it and we started playing what we found was that we had so much fun just kind of exploring and creating environments we found that when we were doing our pen and paper prototyping what was really so enjoyable about the game for the players was just looking around and finding things so that's kind of what we ended up honing in on um and also yes uh good hard jake we found out the hard way so again we had never worked with blueprints before we never coded a game before um <laughs> we initially had all these bespoke systems that we made ourselves um controlling all the logic in the game and it, it was terrible it was horrible um and we ended up eventually just finding assets um pre-made code that basically did everything that we coded ourselves but better so we reinvented the wheel and then threw out the wheel that we invented which also took a ton of time <laughs> um and we did discover the hard way that you actually can die in this demo there's um <laughs> there's that there's the metal gear solid ladder at the end you can totally just miss the ladder and fall to your death um did you guys play amnesia back in the day i actually did not i know a lot of people who are massive massive fans of amnesia and i actually have not played it myself um i believe i got it for free from the epic store so that is 100 percent something that i should probably check out at some point um one thing that's also i don't think i mentioned it the first time around um you know at this point we're a disney park attraction and we're gonna keep getting back in line <laughs> as i remember things that we missed because again um this is exploration focused so there are tons of little details and things that are just kind of hidden around um again anytime that we play test of this people would always solve things in completely different orders and it's hard for me to replicate that because I know where everything is. That's just the nature of the beast. Uh, that's right, this door is locked. So if we go back in there. Yeah, no, we. I 100% agree it'd be great to play Amnesia as player reference. Um, intended game mechanic to strive for roll so there's a there's a fun thing with being able to fall down the ladder and us not expecting that is that we also placed a save game like right before that can potentially happen when you open the cellar door the game saves now theoretically if this demo worked the way we intended and there wasn't fall damage it wouldn't be possible to fall to your death however we save the game for a completely different reason in fact we don't even necessarily have to save the game we just have to show the text the reason why the save why the game saves is because it's kind of inherent in the vocabulary of gamers that if a game auto saves it's for a reason and it turns out you can 100% scare people just by telling them that you saved the game. It, it, it was great. We it, it totally worked, too. When people were playing this, they'd unlock the door and open the door to the silver, and they'd see this long hallway, and they'd see game saved. And they'd immediately start freaking out, and they don't realize that all that's going to happen is a T-posing man is going to appear at the end of the hall but that's all it takes <laughs> that's
That's all it takes. Just, again, the smallest gesture can get the biggest scares. And something as small as saving a game, because that's so ingrained in the literacy of game design, it's quite effective. This game is also perfect for speedrunning. Yes. So, <laughs> I was struggling figuring out how to present this leading up to today. Um, aside from treating it as it is, which is, uh, you know, it's a haunted house. <laughs> Um, I was struggling with thinking how to present this because, again, I know all the solutions. I know everything that's going to happen, and I had to sit there and pace myself and think, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, what would you actually look for? <laughs> um, it's a fun, bizarrely unintuitive thing to think about, to think about how you would actually look around. Uh, pre-made stuff is always recommended to use to save time. Yeah, there is more pre-made stuff in here than we intended there to be as well. Um, the our, our designated modeler ended up not doing designated modeling. He ended up doing a lot of other things. <laughs> because any asset we, uh, we needed, we happened to just kind of find. And then, just for fun, like, I'm pretty sure every single chair in, the chair in this room can be picked up and thrown. People would spend, like, 20, 30 minutes picking up and throwing chairs, and I don't blame them. It, it, it's way too much fun. But yeah. When we, so when we go over here and uh, open the door, and also, ooh, I can show off a bug that I completely forgot to fix. And I compiled this build 10 minutes before I started presenting. Don't do that, but I need to... <laughs> it's a horrible, horrible advice, but I need to increase the exposure in some of the scenes. It was just a bit too dark for streaming purposes. Um, but because this is a recent build and some of the stuff was recently placed here, I can showcase um, unlocking the door and getting the save game. Boom, game saved. An effective scare. Also, uh, that sign isn't attached. <laughs> isn't attached to the door. Don't let him out. It's magic paper. <laughs> so, I guess what's left to talk about... <laughs> yes, that is how you pad runtime. Um, I guess what's really left to talk about is the, uh... It's the future of this project because this is something that is an ongoing thing for us and we haven't gotten the time well now we're into summer so now we have all the time in the world to uh yeah now we have all the time in the world to work on this project and at this point there um the, the double-edged sword of using systems that you find is you essentially have to then learn those systems, which is very different from learning something that is well-documented, like the entire Unreal Engine. Um, so... Um, oh, and also it's worth pointing out that originally the man with the broken neck was 100% supposed to chase you. That's where the gun was supposed to come into play, but we, we just thought it was fun to just kind of have him show up. <laughs> A lot of students don't realize that plugins and asset stores are viable options. Yes, I've 100%... I think that, you know, there's a bit of a, um, a stigma outside of game design where, you know, a lot of people look out 
the outside in, there's plenty of gamers, people who play games, who love games, who genuinely mean the best, who are familiar with the concept of an asset flip. And we've all seen games that were made without the best design intentions, games that, for to be blunt, didn't have much heart to them, where people seem to have just thrown assets together. But ultimately, it is so incredibly unattainable for a small studio to make everything themselves. It's it's completely ridiculous. And nowadays, with again, with Unreal Engine 5 and their new Nanite, where you can have millions of polygons on screen, you know, you don't need to make your own model of a tree, of a canister, of, you know, these basic everyday things if you have, like, the hero asset, if you have the perfect asset. It's never going to age. So there's no shame in using things that you find. And much of this game, I mean, it wouldn't we wouldn't be able to make the game as visually striking in the time that we had had we not utilized assets. We spent our time on the puzzles, on the layout, on learning how to code for the first times in our lives. Um, and we let effectively, you know, the free assets that we could find do the small, tiny detail work. So, at this point, I again, I really wish... <laughs> I, I really wish I, um was able to finish the sewer level ahead of time. Um, fun fact, Nanite can't support transparency, nor is it good with foliage. I agree. I have been using it since Unreal Engine 5 came out, and yeah, it's, um, it's limited in a delightfully fun way. But again, one of the first things that I did when Unreal 5 came out was I threw this game in there. Why not? <laughs> uh, see how it ran. Be able to test out all of the new features. And it turns out that's actually quite great for interiors. And one thing I forgot to mention, we did consider making this game in VR. And I still think it'd be good in VR. Um, now unfortunately Nanite doesn't support VR. But that is the use case I hope it does in the future, because being able to pick objects up and hold them right up to your face and get every last little pixel, every last little detail, I think it'd be absolutely delightful. Um, and I'd love to make a VR port of, uh, of this title. Um, in fact, I think that's probably where the future of this game best belongs. Again, this isn't an action game. There, there's nothing, there's no reason why teleport locomotion and the ability to, you know, reach out and grab and open doors. Um, I, I think that this would be the perfect VR game. And that's the next step that I think would be a lot of fun for us to take as developers and again as as students who are uh <laughs> who are learning the technology you know and there there are plenty of other there there are plenty of other delightful you know cheats and breaks we have here great way to give the impression of a city is make sure you can't see any cars play uh, stereo audio going left to right but don't actually place any cars you don't need to do that in fact you don't even need roads 
It's Back to the Future. We don't need roads for Kelly. I think it's valuable to show off. Um, the I think it's valuable to show off, quote unquote, cheating, the tricks, the things that you find out, things that you're not supposed to notice. But I think it's cute to know um, how things are pulled off. I, th I think that you know, kind of showcasing the the sort of small details that. You know, kind of give the impression of the scene. It's just a lot of fun. Alex was the scariest experience I've had in a game. Yeah, Alex is the big reason why I want to make this a VR experience. Why I think that that's the next step for us as developers and the next step for this game specifically. Um, this one hundred percent um a a changing experience for me as a developer to play through Half-Life Alex, and I, I think that VR is really the future of multiple genres and horror is probably the biggest one. Thank you for saying that you enjoy the conversation, um, because <laughs> that's what I have. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have a camera ready, I didn't have a this was submitted last minute, um, and I wish that I had more time to give to it before presenting, but I have a microphone, I have um, my thoughts and experience, and I have a, a squeaky chair that might occasionally get picked up as I rock back and forth. It is all a magic trick. It is indeed all a magic trick, and that's the goal, to, to kind of be the magician behind it all. Yeah, there is a lot of psychology uh, behind it, and that's, that's essentially in a nutshell what this was always going to be, regardless of our initial plans. Um, and what we were able to get done, what we weren't, was an experiment in sort of psychology of what we can get a player to think, to feel, to do with as little prodding as possible. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, I think I described earlier this game as being narrative driven and as you have probably seen throughout this, it's not entirely true. Um, there's not a lot of story, there's just kind of, there's just kind of enough um, story so that you can know where you're going and what's going to happen next. Kind of, you, you get the idea of what we are getting at and that's another thing that came from our prototyping um in the tabletop is that you know we found that again ex just exploring and finding things is enjoyable enough and while i wish that we had more things for you to find uh, throughout these two environments that we painstakingly designed. Um, it turns out to be quite a fun gameplay loop to just enjoy where you are. And yeah, no, discussing the smoke and mirrors of game design level making is one of my favorite parts of making a game. Um, just because, you know, I love being able to discuss the tricks, the traps, especially the ones that you actually get to use, because that's the interesting part to me, is, is all the puzzle solving. Yeah, no, I think it's definitely a good idea to add a, um content warning to VR horror because it does have a um, a psychological effect, you know, 
there are certain things like, again for like developing this there are certain things that we would want to change specifically because of the VR medium um even you know just think about it right now even things as little as um you know in this demo you walk around and you place the statue in the office and you get launched into another room um but in vr most players are likely already teleporting around to get places and i genuinely wonder if getting teleported into the into another area of the map would be um would be as engaging as shocking in vr as it is you know in normal gaming um but yeah i think that a lot of vr kind of needs content warnings um it, it, it's kind of amazing how things that a lot of games do i i can't speak for everyone but um again this game initially had shooting mechanics and they were probably gonna come back as a puzzle thing where you could like shoot out lights and stuff like that we were always talking about where um guns would have a place in this game because they can be useful tools for puzzle solving um but one thing that I found from VR is that something as simple and as normal in game design as shooting a gun can actually kind of feel kind of uncomfortable. In VR, it's a very different thing to, um, to point and shoot a gun with your controllers. Um, and while, again, for our, uh, for, for this game, I think that that would be like the perfect puzzle element. Um, it's always something to think about. Yeah, generally speaking, when you move things into VR, um, doing smooth locomotion like this in a game, like, you know, we're used to in games, it can be very nauseating, especially to people that have never played VR before. And while hmm, while you can adapt to it you definitely can kind of grow vr legs much like you know sea legs um it's not a good idea to require people to do smooth locomotion and the fact is is that because we have the sort of lovecraftian inspiration we can come up with a million excuses for why you can teleport <laughs> You know, there, there's a million magical, dark, ancient god excuses we can give to teleport. Phasmophobia VR? Yeah, I do own Phasmophobia. But, uh, oh boy. Do I... Oh man, VR horror 100% has a massive effect on me. Um, which is part of the reason why I want to make it because I'm, I'm blown away by how much of a psychological effect it has on me as a player when I play it. Um, it's one of the games think that uh, Phasmophobia did smooth locomotion well. I can't necessarily think of a game that did smooth locomotion bad. Um, more so that it's an accessibility thing. And I know plenty of people who just can't, um, who just can't tolerate it. Yeah. Yeah, just toss an Elder God in the mix, give you the power to teleport, uh, five feet away. <laughs> um... And I bet it's terrifying. I, I am not the strongest when it comes to VR or when it comes to horror. Absolutely not. Um, horror in general has a big impact on me. Um, making it in VR, one hundred percent makes it worse. And by that, of course, I one hundred percent mean better. 
Yeah, throwing around chairs for 30 minutes. I can <laughs> I can do it too. My playtesters did. <laughs> and yeah, I 100% agree that accessibility is key. I mean, again, I, one of the first things that we realized with making a, a game in black and white is that it makes it accessible. And that's another interesting thing to think about when porting a game to VR. You know, what would it do to have your entire viewpoint of the world be in black and white you know our inspiration for making it black and white is to literally simulate um film itself but that's kind of a problem when you're seeing the world through your own eyes <laughs> I, I i imagine that a vr game in black and white would be not disorienting but definitely nonsensical now technically um <laughs> we have reached the chair throwing part of the game again um technically this game was quote unquote designed in color as in the post-processing effect that makes it black and white came last you know we much like real life photography we made the set out of colored objects and then transitioned it to black and white later you know one thing you never know if i didn't tell you is that these walls are green and you could call that my tribute to stanley kubrick who famously demanded a green table in a black and white film but I just thought that these walls looked great green and because we <laughs> designed for color it gives um, a distinct tone even when you switch it to black and white. You know I still had to just double check that you can't actually activate this twice because I'm gonna be honest I haven't even tried it. The more I talk about in VR, the more I want to try it. I got the headset sitting there. I just haven't uh, gotten the I haven't gotten the chance to develop for it yet. Um, I've had a lot of fun playing VR games, and it's inspired how I think about games outside of the medium. Um, again, I'm I'm sorry that the last half an hour <laughs> has been uh, me talking about. Um, where we want to go in the future. Um, I, I wish I could have prepared more to actually show, but I've, I've definitely enjoyed um, thinking aloud. One thing that we did um, attempt doing early on, it's worth mentioning, just in the last couple minutes I had, um, and we still experiment with, was we had black and white and then all the blood was still red, um, or at least we attempted it. And first of all, finding a good way to actually do that effect without making all of your assets black and white is not great. <laughs> but... Um, you know, I'm extremely happy with how just the pure black and white looks. You know, it definitely, I think that we 100% achieved the film noir sort of styling um, that inspired us to begin with.
so um yeah no i definitely um i want to thank you all for coming and watching and uh <laughs> and for having a little fireside chat with me over the last hour um i've definitely i i've enjoyed the opportunity to showcase this and talk about this and bounce my thoughts off of uh off of those of you watching so um it's been an absolute pleasure and i i look forward to continuing development to really um expanding out and considering and way to hmm for continued development um it's a great question we released the game on uh itch.io or at least this current build that we have so excuse me um you can at least find what we have done there um i get any updates that we make will of course be posted there i would say that that's the best place to look but anywho um thank you all for your time i i've greatly enjoyed this and it's been delightful um so until next time goodbye <laughs>